those kind of good memories try to help me remember that. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these questions on the board. Um, rules to write a set in set building notation. Yes, and does anybody know what, oh, there's the cover to this. The rules to write uh, a set in set building notation is that you start with your curly braces that indicate a set. There's some type of expression or variable here, so like x. So if I wanted to write um, the set of all numbers greater than or equal to 2, this is how I would do it in set builder notation. On the number line, I would just do it a line with the double arrows. I'd put a 2. I'd fill in my circle, and then I'd do like this heavy major thing that way. Okay? Maybe I should do this on the lecture notes so that you can actually see what, uh, what I'm doing if you happen to miss the class. So if we were trying to say, if we were trying to represent the set of all numbers greater than or equal to 2, in set builder notation, then you start again with the curly braces, some variable like x or an expression, and then you have that straight line up and down that you read as such that, and then you'd use an inequality. x is greater than or equal to 2, and then you'd close your curly braces like that. Okay. That set builder notation, this is a graphical notation that we just put on the board. And in a few days, you're going to learn another notation that looks like this. That's called interval. But this is, this is uh, coming attractions. Okay? This is coming up. Okay. So that's Cornelius's question. And then Mary asked some questions about the math lab site. And she says, can you save your homework before you finish? The answer is, who put the yeses up there? Did some other student go up and help? Oh, thanks, Kyle. Um, so uh, yes, you can. It does it automatically. <laughs> so you don't even have to worry about it. So if you close out, it saves what you've done. Are there time limits for homework? Absolutely not. Your only time limit, limit to get full credit is the deadline. The deadline is always the Wednesday of the following week. So, when, so this week's homework, we only have two days this week, Wednesday and Friday. They both do next Wednesday, which is 9-11. All of next week's homework is due the next Wednesday, 9-18. All of the homework after that is due 9-25. Okay? So they're always due the, the Wednesday after the week we cover it, generally. Sometimes we have a class just before a test that will be like two days later that homework will be due. But that happens once, maybe twice a semester. Uh, will we have any quizzes or evaluations online? No. All the quizzes will be in class. Okay, thank you, Mary, for those questions. Jen, is there a better method between the set builder way to represent sets and the roster method? Is there a better method? Well, the roster method can only be used for things that are finite that you can count. Um, the set builder notation, this Notation allows you to represent something that's infinite, because this set is infinite. There's an infinite number of numbers that are bigger or equal to 2. And some people like this interval notation, which we're coming to. They really like this way, rather than having to remember all these fancy symbols. OK, so I think, Jen, your answer there might be coming up in, in later attractions here. Okay. Uh, where on my math lab does it say when the homework is due? Uh, I think, and that was Sam's question, um, right um, when you click on the home, when you see your homework, that you'll see class one homework. It says right here, do 9-11 at 2 p.m. I think there's even a clock there or something. So it's 2 p What do you mean a countdown? Oh, really? Oh, cool. I didn't even know that yet because I've just set, I just set the time days. So, yeah, boy, it's not, nothing like having a little built-in time management for our lives, right? Which is always helpful. Um, Lenny was asking questions about uh, that probably has to do with scientific notation, which was one of the things you were supposed to review on your own uh, about uh, if you have uh, 10 to a, 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 positive, uh, a positive integer, 
then that number, like in this case, 10 squared represents, the 2 represents the number of zeros after 1. If you have 10 raised to a negative integer, that tells you how many decimal places after the decimal point to the right of the decimal point. Um, when were the number, oh, Kyle asked about when all the different numbers came, the number systems came in in terms of the names. I don't know my history dates that well, but they were various times. For example, I do know that negative numbers were not sort of in vogue until the Renaissance period. I love this little story. Um, negative numbers comes from the Latin root, those of you who are uh, language buffs, comes from the Latin root, negar, and that means to deny. And when, you know, because everything was done with trade and that was a sort of only positive quantities. And once these negative numbers came into existence, people wanted to deny that they existed. They couldn't, like, they couldn't wrap their heads. I mean, what we take for granted is our evolution as a, as a species and our cognitive evolution, that this idea of negative numbers doesn't seem so foreign to us. But back in the Renaissance period, that's where they got the name negative numbers because of the sense of wanting to, to deny their existence, just like the square root of two in the Greek society. And again, as Tara feels, why are imaginary numbers a thing? We don't want to really believe in imaginary numbers as existing um, because they're kind of hard to wrap our heads around. I think for us at this point, imaginary numbers are still a little tough. Imaginary numbers are not real numbers. They're separate in the sense that uh, just like irrational numbers, you can't be rational and irrational at the same time. We know that. You're in one state or the other, right, depending on your mood. You can be real are not real, and that would be imaginary or complex. We'll get to that class seven when we talk about quadratics. Okay, and then this one was right from the homework. On, and when I did an item analysis of the homework looking at, see, I get to peek in and see how you're doing on your homework. I know I'm just a voyeur, but I can't help it. Um, if you, this was the, this tends to be the problems that students have the most difficulty with. And we started class off Wednesday talking about this a little bit, all the different numbers and types of numbers. Um, and the natural numbers there, remember, natural numbers are counting numbers. They're not whole numbers. There's a little bit of a difference. Natural numbers are what you would say, one, two, three, four, five, six, like that, like a kid, if I said, if you see a little kid that's starting to count. Whole numbers include zero. They're the natural numbers with zero. So natural, the only natural number in this list is what this represents. That represents 8, square root of 64. So that's the natural number. 0 is a whole number. It's not a natural number. Okay. So the whole numbers there are 0 and square root of 64, which is 8. The natural number is only 8. Yep. No. It's an integer. Negative 7 is an integer. So here's the whole numbers. Zero. Sort of the numbers you always just want to, you don't, you know, the ones you like. You don't want to think about anything in between. And then all of the, all of these, remember, zero is the only exception. It has itself as its own opposite. When you take all of the natural numbers of the whole numbers and you create their opposites, then you get the set with that we call integers. And that's what negative 7 is. So the number 8 has three classes or categories it can belong to, actually more. 8 could be a whole number, it could be a natural number, it's a rational number, and it's a real number. Okay? Now some of you can think about that for yourself in life. You're, my, you're all part of Math 107B, you're all GCC students. Right? And then each of you may have other affiliations that you belong to. You might belong to the 4-H club. You might, you know, be a member of a board. You know, you might um, be part of the Denny's Corporation. I don't know. Whatever it is, you have different pieces of you that is your identity, right? Just like with numbers, they have different identities, different subclasses of sets that they belong to. It is not a natural number. It is only a whole number. Natural numbers begin at 1. That's the definition. No, that's whole numbers, not natural. Yep. 
You want to look it up? Go ahead. Yep. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at. Um, oh, uh, you didn't write up the answers to your thingy wingy, your anticipation guide. Please put them up each table, and I'll copy them. Your answers by table for your anticipation guide. What tables? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Try to get them up by uh, 11 o'clock. Kyle? Oh, good. Table 5 has theirs. Okay, great. Table 5. Oh, false. False. True. True. Okay. Table 2. False. Take a look. Yes. I agree with that the first one is false, that 2 to the negative 4 does not mean negative 16. A negative exponent does, has nothing to do with negative numbers. What it means is, remember, you can write negative 4 as negative 1 times positive 4, so you could either write this problem like this, or you could write it like this, because when you use your exponent properties, you multiply these two powers. So most of you do it this way. You raise 2 to the 4th power, you call it 16, and the negative 1 says, put me in the denominator, or put me from the numerator to the denominator, or the denominator to the numerator. It's a movement, a reciprocal idea, a flipping idea. The negative never touches um, the exponent itself. The biggest mistake my 106 students make is that they change negative 4 to its reciprocal 1 4. Never touch the exponent. You can never change the meaning of the exponent. So this means, or you could apply the negative. There's two actions here. You have to raise 2 to the 4th power, and you have to take the reciprocal. It doesn't matter the order, because when you multiply, your order doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter how you perform those actions, but you have the responsibility of two actions. So you could first take the reciprocal of 2, which is 1 over 2, 1 half, and then you could say 1 half times 1 half times 1 half times 1 half, which is 1 16. So these, these both represent 1 16. So you're all in agreement there. Oops, I've got to put table 4 up. F, F, T, F. Okay, it seems that we're all in agreement with 3. Yes, the square... Well, a to the one half, you can if you know this, well, first of all, even if you don't know what the one half power means, you know what to do when you have the same base and you multiply. What do you do to your exponents? Add them. So this is you keep your base the same and you always add your exponents. It doesn't matter if they're fractions or integers, whatever they are, you get to add them. 1 half and 1 half is the first power, and we represent that as just A. So that's true. The other way to represent that what is that A to the 1 half power has means this, the square root of A. So the square root of A times the square root of A is the same as the square root of A times A, which is the square root of A squared. These two guys undo each other. When you take the square root of a perfect square, you come right back to your base, which is A in this case. And what you're going to see today is I actually have to write this like that. I have to put a, absolute values there, but we'll get to that later in the lecture. All right. So now we have a little controversy with the first one here. Everyone says it's false except for table one. So someone want to argue... Um, who said it was false to try to convince table one why that's false. So what is, I'll write whatever it is you say on the board. So the problem starts off x to the 14th divided by x to the 7th. So, yep, Kyle? We're not multiplying. Oh, when you multiply, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yep, yep. Yep, that's right. You add, multiplication and division are inverse operations of each other. So if when you multiply, you add the exponents. When you divide, you subtract them. 
So the answer here is what? X to the seventh. What did table one do? They divided the exponents, right? Now, I'm gonna, this is where I will shut off the recording. Okay. All right. So what other one did we have? So, oh, just the last one. Square root of negative 16. There is no real number on that number line that you can square and get negative 16. So no real number exists, but there's another number system we're going to be getting on um, uh, learning on class 7 called the complex number system that has imaginary numbers that will deal with that. So right now that is a true statement that the square root of negative 16 is not a real number. Okay? All right, so let's start off. I'm um, hoping that a lot of this very beginning stuff today we can cover pretty quickly. Um, it's just going over some notation ideas, some language about radicals. Please make note, folks, at the top, it says that you're responsible for two sections today, P2 and P3. Note, your first section is on exponents and exponent properties and scientific notation. That's a self-review. I won't be covering that today. So you need to read that section in your book and take some notes for yourself as needed. Whatever you need, depending on your memory or your background or how long it's been since you've had math. We're going to try to cover radicals and rational exponents today, and I'm going to try to leave you some group time to work. And I can't go as slow as I did in my first class because we didn't, we didn't get there. So someone want to start us off, Lenny, with this? Okay. Okay. So what what does the what would the 25 actually represent if I started drawing something inside of the square? What would it actually represent? What does 20 what does an area of 25 square units mean? Right, there's 25 squares inside of them depending on the unit. So let's say if if s here represents 5 then if I carefully divide this, well, it's not quite equal. I did the best I could, all right? You just, you know, just use your imagination, all right? Suppose those are all equally spaced. Then I would have 25 square units in here. That's what the area represents, 24, 25, 25 square units. Area is a two-dimensional measurement, squared. When we ask for the square root of something, when we ask, when we use this symbol, this is saying find the length of the side of a square whose area is 25. So they're now asking you to tell you what would be the length of the side. And if you can write this number as a perfect square, Voila, you have your answer right there. It's 5. Okay, it's 5 times 5. Again, some students like to say, oh yeah, these two things undo each other. Just like multiplication and division undo each other, and, mul and, excuse me, and adding and subtracting, squaring and square rooting undo themselves. Okay? They're inverse operations. So we use this symbol, this sign, the square root symbol, always indicates the principal square root of a number. Now notice another way you can say that is it's non-negative. A lot of people say, well, can't you just say positive, Linda? Well, then you're forgetting about zero. But most of us think about it as the positive square root, okay? Because who wants to say, go around saying non-negative all the time? So that symbol represents whatever comes out of there has to be positive, okay? However, in general, all positive numbers have how many square roots? Not now geometrically, but how many, how many types of, how many numbers could you actually square to get 25? Two, you could square two numbers to get 25. So they have two square roots. One of them is five, right? Positive. And what would be the other one? Negative, right, negative five, right. So just like this represents the principal, oh, we'll say positive square root. To say the opposite, what do you do when you want to make an opposite? You put a little dash out in front. That's how we write the negative square root. Okay. 
So to indicate square roots, you sometimes need to use a plus and a minus. All right. So if I wanted to represent both square roots, I would put a plus and minus out front like this. So that tells me I know that 25, there's two numbers I can build by squaring them to get 25. So in general, this is, this is just some language, vocabulary. If some of this is new, write it at the end of your notes like I suggested the other day. This little, the little root you're taking, this little n here, that's called an index right there, the n. The symbol is a radical symbol. It actually has another kind of crazy name, but we won't get into that. And the thing that sits under the radical sign is called the radicant. Okay. So I think hopefully most of this should be pretty familiar to you. The positive square root of 144, how's your multiplication? 12. Okay, 12 times 12. So what would be the negative square root? Negative 12. And then to, to symbolically represent both, you do plus and minus 12. And guess what? Radicals are just a fancy way to write exponents. So if you had 16 over 25 raised to some power, that's a quotient raised to a power. So the power has to apply itself to both the numerator and denominator. And since a radical is, can be written as an exponent, the exponent applies itself to both the numerator and denominator. So that's 4 fifths. This is negative 4 fifths plus and minus four-fifths. Any questions on that? Now, sometimes we get a positive number like seven that we can't simplify. So the only way we can actually represent its square root is just to say square root of seven. We can't further simplify it. We can't make it rational because it's irrational, right? So the only ones that we can make rational are the perfect squares. It's irrational. So the negative square roots that way, and then you put a plus and minus sign in front of both of them. Has a home on the number line, a unique place, okay? One and only one place, just like the number two has one and one, only one place. Okay, and then finally we have the square root of negative 49, and what do we say about that? Yeah, it's, no, it's not real. All right. All right, so we'll deal with that, class seven. Okay, right now you don't have to do anything but to say it's not real. Okay. It's kind of a, a misnomer. Well, I kind of wish they didn't call imaginary numbers imaginary because it really does make you feel like they're just made up and they don't really have an ex a real use, but they do. Um, especially if you've ever done any electrical work or physics you t and you've studied electricity and physics, you know I has a meaning in physics and electricity. Okay, so here's where things are going to be a little bit different if you've recently had like a math uh, 106 or an intermediate algebra class is in the next couple of sections and how we notate our answers. So what would be the square root of 8 squared? What would you write for an answer? 8. And sometimes people are okay just looking at it. Sometimes people actually square the 8 out and then realize the number I squared to get 64 is sitting right there looking at me, 8. And then this says the square root of negative 8 squared. And what does negative 8 squared look like? It looks like this, negative 8 times negative 8, which is the same thing. It's 64. So this is the same thing as the number 64. So what would be the principal square root of 64? 8. So. Notice, now I just want to point out one other thing that drives my intermediate algebra students crazy. If you're squaring a negative number, it must be in parentheses. Because if you write this notation, even though it looks the same to the untrained eye, and even the eye that's had some training, these two are not the same. This says I'm squaring 8. The base on this second one right here is 8. And then I'm taking its opposite. So this really says this, which really says this, which really says that. So anytime you represent a negative quantity and you're raising it to an even power, you must put it in parentheses. The base 
must be in parentheses. Okay? So that's just one of those little things you really got to just kind of get down. Shane? Where's B? Because what does what does this symbol ask for? What root are we do, do we want to come out of there? Square root. And what, which one of the square roots? The positive or the negative? Well, remember we came back here. When we use this symbol, which one do we want? The positive root if we want the negative right now but but Shane's getting at a very important idea here he's noticing that what went into this one and got squared was the number 8 and what went into this one that got squared was negative 8 but yet it didn't come out looking the same did it, it didn't come out looking the same Mary the, that's what it's called that symbol is called the principal square root because it's telling you I want the positive square root. If you want a negative square root, you've got to put the dash out in front of that symbol. That's just what they call it. That's the name they give to it. All right. So, you know what? Yep. It has to be. Yes. So what, now, separate from this, what other mathematical now concept, not an operation like a negative times a negative, what concept have we talked about, hint, hint, on Monday that makes a, positive, a number positive no matter what? Absolute value. And what's the concept that absolute value deals with? What's the concept? What's the idea behind absolute value? Uh, magnitude, yes. Another word that maybe more people are familiar with. The relation to zero, the distance from zero, and distance is always positive, right? So the mathematical concept behind absolute value is the distance from zero. So if you're at negative 10, you say, hey, I'm 10 units from zero. And if you're at its op, that's how we define opposites. We say their absolute values are equal. Their distance from zero is the same. So absolute value, right? So, folks, now, when you're dealing with asking for the principal square root of a squared, a squared, we don't know whether a is acting like the 8 up here or like the negative 8. We don't know whether A is positive or negative, but we know something that when it comes out of here, it's going to be what? It's going to be positive. So the only way to ensure that what we write here really represents a positive number, regardless of whether A started out to be positive or not, is to put absolute values on your answer. So if this said the square root of 12 squared and you wrote this, The absolute value of 12, you know you're okay because that equals 12. If you write the uh, principal square root of negative 12 square and you write the absolute value of negative 12, you're golden. You could leave it like that or you could simplify it and call it 12. Okay? You must include, whenever you're dealing with variable expressions under there, you must include absolute value because unlike Math 106 where they say, assume all variables are greater than or equal to zero. We're not assuming that anymore. So we have to put that absolute value symbol around it. So for example, if you were asked to simplify this expression, the way you do this, I'm showing you a property rule. I'm jumping ahead a little bit. You take the square root of 4 and you take the square root of x squared. Okay? Now in Math 106, you took Math 106, you were allowed to say 2x. Okay, I'm putting that in like ghost writing. But now you have to say 2 times the absolute value of x. So we don't know what x is. And that's how you see it in your answer key. Okay? So that's just a little bit different than what you've done before. Radicals are so hard for a lot of students in 106 when they see them that we, we 
we probably maybe we shouldn't be enabling and and take out the assume everything's positive, but I think it's just enough to handle what radicals mean and simplifying them at that point. Okay, so let's try to scoot through this together uh, and see if we can find a pattern. Does this pattern, this idea of needing to put things in absolute value, does it hold for cube roots, fourth roots? Does it hold for all roots? So let's let's try to find out what is the cube root of five cubed. Does anybody know the answer to that? It's the the answer is one twenty five. It's the cube root of one twenty five. I agree with that. Which is what five. Okay. So so far this answer looks just like the base, right? But it's really when we get to the negative parts to see whether we have to put it in absolute value. Okay. So what's this going to ask us? The cube root of negative 5 times negative 5 times negative 5 is negative 125. And so what number do I cube to get negative 125? You're looking at it. What is it? Negative 5. And guess what? That looks the same. So it comes out looking just like it did when it went in. No problem. Let's try um, 5 to the 4th. What is the 4th root of 5 to the 4th? We don't have to do it out. Can you just see? What do you raise to the fourth? It's five. They're right there. This is asking, the fourth root says, what number do I raise to the fourth power to get five to the fourth? Five. These undo each other. They're inverse operations. Looks the same as it did when it went in. Okay? Now, this is where you have to multiply it out because it's asking for the principal square root, any even root is the principal square root. So the fourth root of 625 is 5. Does not look the same. Nope. So you so in this case, you got to be careful. Your answer is 5 if this was a variable like like this. You'd have to put the absolute value around it. Positive and even, yes. All right, and then here we get 5, here we get negative 5. Here we get 5, and here we get the absolute value of 5, which is 5. So what kind of conclusion can you re reach? When do we have to worry about that absolute value symbol? Yeah, when the exponent, in this case the index, is even. When it's odd, it's going to look just like it is it is inside the the um, rat the radicand. Right. So again, with my little memory cr stuff that I've been trying to share with you, uh, my co colleague uh, Ian, and trying to help his students remember this because he came up with this little memory device. When n is odd, don't modify. Do not modify it in any words. It looks exactly the same. You end up where you started. If you start with a and n is odd you end with A. No need to modify, okay? If N is even, absolute value gets its revenge. See, and revenge is even. It's a little bit of a stretch, but hey, you know, it's an attempt to kind of help you out. All right. So working with um, radicals and doing the product rule for square roots or any kind of root, um, is exactly the same as when you have your exponent property when you um, raise something to a power. The, the thing here with the and is that I want you to see that this goes in both directions. That if you start out already with a product of some sort underneath the radicand, you can split it up into the two factors. If you start off with two separate radicals that you're multiplying, as long as the index is the same, you can put them together and, and then try to simplify it. So for example, I'm going to skip the 9 times 4. With the square root of 400, unless you know right now that 20 square is 400, which many some of you may, I don't know how many, you may want to try to break that up into two numbers that you can multiply that you could take the square root of. So what do you normally think of? What number might you think of as a number that would divide into 400 evenly that is a perfect square? Oh, yeah, you think of 25? Yep, that's true, 25, so or 100. Anybody else? 10. Is 10 a perfect square, though? 
No. Okay. So, so breaking this up, so let me go with Shane's. Breaking this up into 10 times 40s, not too much help for you. You could get there, but you're going to have to go right back to the beginning. Breaking up 400 into 25 times 16, both of those are perfect squares, right? So that might be a help. Deciding to break 400 up into, what was the other thing I heard? 100 times, square root of 100 times the square root of 4 is probably, so either one of these would probably help you. The choice is yours. Sometimes you only have one choice because only one of the factors is a perfect square. In this particular case, both 25 and 16 is a perfect square in and of itself, and 104 is a perfect square. So in this case, you get the square root of 25 times the square root of 16, which is 5 times 4, which is 20. Then you can check it. Does 20 square equals 400? Yep. Here you get 10 times 2, which is 20. Okay. But you see, even though what Shane said is correct, square root of 10 times square root of 40, it's a lot more work to get to that 20. You can get there. I'll show you how. But this would probably not be the route you'd want to take. It's kind of like the longest route to the swamp and the, you know, the trees and all that. You have the square root of 10. You could break square root of 40 up into what two numbers do you multiply to get 40 where one's a perfect square? Four and one is a perfect square. You're going to get yourself into more trouble if you do two and 20. So let's just go with the four and the 10. Okay. So look what we have. I'm just going to rearrange the order because it's all multiplication. Square root of 4 is 2. Square root of 10 times square root of 10. Now I'm going to go this way. Square root of A times square root of B is square root of A times B. Square root of 10 times square root of 10 is square root of 100. And what's the square root of 100? 10. So I get back to 20. So choosing 10 and 40 is not incorrect. It just means you've got to do a little more work to get to the answer of 20. Okay, so those initial um, factors that you divide your radicand up, you want to look for the largest perfect square possible. And um, in this case, it's 100, but 25 and 16 get you there as well. Okay? So try f square root of 500 at your seats. Okay, so most of you broke 500 up into the two factors, 100 times 5 or 5 times 100, it doesn't matter the order. And you got square root of 100 times square root of 5, which is 10 square roots of 5. How do you check that? All right, you square this, right? And that's A, B. That's this exponent rule where the power applies to both factors. So 10 times 10, as Adam said, and then the square root of 5 squared. So that's 10 times 10 is 100. These two undo each other. Times 5, you get 500. Okay. Now, sometimes you're given a multiplication problem where you go, Bleh! right? Square root of 6x, I can't simplify that. Square root of 2x, I can't simplify that. However, remember, this property goes in both directions. So here's where someone's not helping you by splitting it up. They've, they've taken 12x squared and they've split it up into 6x times 2x. So that's, that's almost like doing this back here, although at least the way that Shane did it, we could, we could wrap ourselves eventually to the answer. Here, it's really going to be tough. So here's sort of where you say, I'm going to go back and start all over again, and I'm going to make the decision how I'm going to split this up into two factors. So you multiply it out, and then you say square root of 12, times square root of x squared, square root of 12, square root of 4, square root of 3. Square root of x squared is, oh, I love it, absolute value of x. Square root of 4 is 2, square root of 3 is square root of 3. Okay, order doesn't matter. You could write 2 times the square root of 3 times the absolute value of x. You could write 2 times the absolute value of x times the square root of 3. doesn't matter. The only thing under that radical is square root of 3. Okay? All right, I'm going to move on because I want you to have time to work the group exercises. Okay, the last thing we have to uh, cover, we've actually already done the quotient rule earlier. Please, in this section here that says important, 
please read it. Make sure you understand it. Write it in your notes. Write it on your palm. Tattoo it on your... Oh, no. Okay. So rational exponents. Let's take a look at these. What does 64 to the 1 half power mean? Square root of 64. That's exactly what it means. Which square root of 64? The principal square root. So what most students do when they see 64 to the 1 half power, what most students do is they go like this. Because that's what square roots mean to them. They don't like want to like deal with square roots as these fractional exponents. So most people convert it to radicals and then do that. Okay? What most people do not do is the following, but it's a nice little strategy for those of you who are trying to pick up some new strategies especially as these problems become a little more complicated, is if you can write the base to an even power, which you can in this case, what's the property of exponents say to do when you have a power to a power? What do you do to those two things? Multiply. So you get 2 times a half. Those are reciprocals of each other, and when you multiply reciprocals, you always get so there's your answer. That's just another way to see the same thing. That's just like doing this, writing 64 like that. And that's why we can say those things undo each other, because 2 times 1 half brings you right back to 1 where you started. I was just showing how you could re look, take another look at this problem without using the radical symbol, but using exponent properties. It's just another strategy, Adam. It doesn't mean you have to do it that way. Okay. Yeah, I'm just like trying to show you as many different ways. Right. Right. Because I happen to know 64 is a is a perfect square. No. You could, but it wouldn't be pretty. Right. So does all right. So here we said 64 says square root. So notice your index, which is your root. Your root goes in the cellar. This is harvest time in the area. Where do we put our roots? No, we don't. When you gather your roots, where do you put them if you're trying to store them? In your barn or your root cellar, right? Roots go in the cellar. Okay, I know, I know that the farming industry is kind of coming back and making a life, but some of you I know have farming families in your background, but most of you probably don't know that information anymore. Anybody live in an old house that has a root cellar? I have a root cellar. No? All right. All right. What does 64 to the one-third mean other than Adam? What root would we be looking at there? Cube root. Right. So this, if you were to rewrite this in radical notation, it would look like that. You could rewrite, because 64 is also a perfect cube like that, and then you got your answer looking at you, right? The cube root and the cube undo each other, and there's your answer, 4. Okay, so 64 is one of those numbers that's both a perfect square and a perfect cube, so you could take the cube root and the square root and wind up with a rational number. Right. If it wasn't a perfect square, Adam's question, when I said it's not pretty, it's because it ends up looking like an irrational number. They're not as pretty to us or as familiar. Okay, so in general, a to the 1n means this, the nth root of a to the 1, which we don't usually write the 1 in, we just go like this. I want you to see what happens to that exponent 1. All right, now we've got 8 to the 2 thirds. I'm just going to do something to you. If that div division by 3 was not there, I covered it up with my hand like this. Has, has the role of 2 changed from what you normally think of it as? Has it changed? No, it's still going to, you're still going to square something, right? Okay? So that hasn't changed. And you have no right to change this exponent. The exponent's 2 thirds. You have two obligations to complete this, to evaluate this. You have to square something. And then what does that 3 in the denominator tell you to do? Not divide anything to what? to take the cube root. So you need to perform two actions, and folks, it doesn't matter which order. One sometimes is just a little easier in terms of your mental math than the other, but you must, somewhere along the way, take a cubed root, 
and square. Square it. And you can do it in either order. If that number sitting there was a number like 1,634 or something, I have to think of a big perfect cube, and I didn't do a very good job. Let's see. 27,000? I'd probably want to take the cube root first before I square it. I don't want to square 27,000 and then try to take the cube root. So normally I suggest you do the root first and then do the remaining exponent, the numerator. So if I were to do this, I would to do the root first, I would say 8 to the 1 3rd power. Some of you are going to think of it this way. You, you, you're still kind of doing your radical notation. It's sort of a little um, out of style. okay? And then you're going to square it. Because 1 3rd times 2 is 2 thirds. That's how I can write 2 thirds. 1 3rd times 2 or 2 times 1 3rd. So 8 to the 1 3rd says, what number do I cube to get 8? And that's the answer is 2. And then I square it, and I get 4. Or I put it in my more familiar, maybe perhaps easier notation of cubed root of 8 is 2. And then I square it. Now, you could square the 8 first and get 64, and then ask for its cubed root. So that's your other choice. You could go 8 squared, and then take the cubed root. If you do it just like it looks, it looks like this. That's what it looks like. You'd square your 8 and then you take the cubed root. But you don't have to do all that radical business. You can just do your root and then apply the power. Okay. Now, Adam, why did I show you this way up here? Because I was thinking of this problem in advance. I'm trying to take a cubed root, right? Can I write this base as a perfect cube? Can I rewrite A as a perfect cube? What is it, Shane? Perfect cube, not square. Can I write eight as? Yeah, what is it? Two times two times two, and how else can I say that? Two to the third. So I can write the same problem just like this. I haven't changed it. It's still eight to the two thirds. I just wrote eight as two, thir two to the third. And what do I do to my powers? M multiply. So 3 times 2 thirds is 2 squared, which is 4. That's the fastest way. But it's probably not going to be the way you think about doing it. So in general, a to the m over n means you're taking the nth root of a raised to the nth, nth power. Okay. Now, you were supposed to practice these, but I got some other practice problems I want you to do. These are just exponent rules. The exponent rules apply no matter what, whether they're fractions, integers, natural numbers, whole numbers, whatever. Adam? Yes, it's supposed to have a y square. My, uh, er, one of my earliest students noticed that. As I said, I redid all these lecture notes. Any typos you find, let me know so I can go back and fix them for next semester. OK, great. So you have. Um, Group activity, you have 15 whole minutes. I would suggest you, now look, we didn't discuss 4, 5, or 6 at all. If, if you think you might have trouble with 4, 5, and 6, work on those and I can help you. You'll need to pay attention to that section of P3 in your book that deals with adding radicals and subtracting them. Look over this, these, oh, one thing, folks, number 2 down here. I'm surprised Adam didn't find this. It's 3 times the absolute value of s, because now we have to put the up. So that's one little change down there. So does anybody mind if I put a little music on in the background? Does that, is that OK? All right. <laughs>